My original draft for this video would have started with me fondly looking back on the Saints Row series, saying some sentimental bullshit like a chapter of our lives is closed, but let's embrace this new beginning. Something gay and optimistic for sure, but it would have been sincere. I tried really hard to like this game. For the sake of being a Saints Row fan, I was willing to mouth milk the nuts of Sir Copium himself. Otherwise, I'd be shrouded in the stark reality that the series would never be good again. I wanted to stay in denial. No, these characters aren't woke hipsters. Let me clarify. These characters aren't insufferable board game playing, karaoke singing, TV binging, LARPing twats motivated to start a gang to escape the harsh pressures that come with living in a late stage capitalist system. Oh, what a nice thing denial is. I wish I could live my whole life there. But sadly, when you encounter something so shocking and fucked up, you can't help but be jolted back into the harsh reality of the world. No amount of Brazilian chainsaw murder videos could have prepared me for this one. I thought Volition ruined Saints Row with Saints Row 3, but my god did they really fuck this game up. We'll get into the story of this game later. I wouldn't want to spoil this masterpiece of a modern AAA campaign for you so early in the video, but where this game completely falls dead in the water for me doesn't even have to do with the story but with its gameplay. Now I could unpack a lot of things here, such as you only have one crib, you can't grab a human shield, there's no ped density at all, you can't rob stores, hell you can't even harm the store owners, the police in this game barely exist, your gang doesn't even patrol the streets, there's no cheats, there's no mission replay, no cutscene viewer, and so on and so on. I could just pull up my classic Saints Row wishlist video and go over everything again, but forget about all those features. Forget about the lack of airplanes, Forget about foregrips looking stupid. Oh man, do I miss when that was the most hated thing. I wish I could bring up their exclusion of all the classic extras that made the Saints Row series so special, but there's no need to even go that deep. The game in general suffers from an overly complicated and clunky combat system that makes playing the game unfun in general. It doesn't matter if they had even included all those features into this game. When shooting things is not satisfying, the core of Saints Row as a game is dead. The previous Saints Row games have a very basic combat system. Literally, the first game doesn't even have fine aim. You just run around and pull the trigger, and that's really all it needs. It feels really good. There's a slightly more advanced playstyle where you quick switch between weapons to manipulate how fast you can deal damage. But besides that, it's the most basic combat system in the series, and in my opinion, it feels the best. It's very fluid, very responsive, feels the most natural, and it does its job as a feature perfectly. Saints Row 2 added fine aims and takedowns. Personally, I never cared to even use these features during my first playthrough. They were fun additions, but it didn't fit my playstyle. And that's okay. The game still feels enough like Saints Row 1 for you to play it that way. Saints Row 3 is where the game feels way more obnoxious with takedowns. Instead of a quick little maneuver, they turn into flamboyant and drawn-out wrestling takedowns. But they're still optional. The gunplay always felt a little off from the previous titles, but there was still that feeling of a loose run-and-gun game even though they were pretty much expecting you to use fine aim to do anything serious. Now the reboot replaces all that simplicity and finesse with an overly complicated combat system that makes shooting things feel like an absolute chore. I don't even know where to begin because the whole system from health bars to flow to takedowns to headshots, it's all a clusterfuck. Let's just keep it simple for now and talk about how shooting works. Hipfire almost doesn't do a thing. Your bullets never feel like they register and it makes you wonder if you're even hitting anything at all. So you might be inclined to want to keep those ugly enemy health bars on so you don't go insane thinking about how spongy the enemies are. But that doesn't matter because even when using fine aim to shoot enemies at point blank range, your bullets can just completely miss. The game has already determined based on some RNG roll if you're going to make the shot. So even if you're firing right at the enemy, they'll do some fucking dumb roll out of the way animation. In fact, what I think I figured out is that if an enemy is performing any kind of dodge animation at all, it makes them invulnerable until the animation ends. So it's not even a matter of skill or how well you can aim. The game just has this dumbass system in place to further complicate enemy defense. There's a robust combat difficulty system that lets you adjust how spongy the enemies are, and you'll be in this menu a lot to tweak the game out. But even trying to figure out the perfect formula for this game, it just never feels right. I'm starting to think it was added by necessity because not even Volition could figure out how to balance this shit. So shooting things just sucks. Hell, even shooting pedestrians. What kind of headshot is this? Does this look satisfying to you? It didn't feel satisfying to me. This little spazzy animation they play before the ragdoll kicks in is god-awful. It makes shooting things feel completely off. There's no feeling of weight to any of the shots. And in fact, I think headshots with enemies only really work if they're the finishing shot. You know, when you drain their health bars? It's just spongy by default, and if your last bullet happens to be in the head, then it counts as extra flow points. Speaking of which, flow is what allows you to do a special attack. 
like a flaming punch, a smoke screen, or, you know, throwing a grenade. Yeah, we don't have throwables like Molotovs or pipe bombs anymore. They treat grenades as if they're a superpower you pull out of your ass when your kill streak is hot. For roughly half the main campaign, I never even used one of these flow abilities because I couldn't figure it out, and once I did, I went right back to forgetting to use them because I feel that they bloat the combat system and don't belong in Saints Row. In fact, this entire system feels like it's right from Agents of Mayhem, but somehow even worse because that whole game was designed for a combat system like this. It does not fit well at all for a Saints Row title. The Mayhem ability system in AOM is now repurposed into takedowns. If you thought they were obnoxious in Saints Row 3 like I did, oh man, they are downright heinous in this game. They are really long, over the top, and almost always break up the flow of combat. Because they are long and utilize complex animations and camera work, it's very often you will see them bug out. I wish you didn't have to do these at all, but you really have no choice. When you're in combat and you lose a health bar, the only way to survive is to do one. Like right here, I'm about to die. I would much prefer to pull out a health pack I purchased at Freckle B I mean FBs, but I have no choice but to take down an enemy in order to survive. Oh no, the dumbass takedown animation locked me out of bounds and now I'm forced to restart the mission. Here's another one. The button to enter vehicles is the same one for takedowns. The takedown overrode entering the vehicle, and so I failed the mission. Great system, guys. Never gets old. And to make combat feel even less like Saints Row, you can't pick up enemy weapons. Come on, where did we lose our way? If the game lets me, I often find myself just running through any combat scenario there is. Gunplay is not fun, and I avoid it at all cost. This is, in my opinion, the biggest misstep in Saints Row, that even without the dog shit story would have ruined this game for me. I even went back and played Saints Row 3 for a bit, and I found combat in that game to be so much more enjoyable. When Saints Row 3 is besting the reboot on the most basic features for an open world shooter, then something is really wrong. It's like Volition really couldn't let go of their obsession with combat design from AOM, and they missed the entire point of Saints Row's combat. Keep it simple, stupid. You introduced an unnecessary system, it doesn't feel like any Saints Row game I have ever played, and it feels like shit. But okay, let's just continue on and talk about some very, very brief positives. The map is good. Is it better than Stillwater? Hell no. Are you going to see a mall and a university in this game? A skyway and caverns? An underground laboratory and lighthouse? An airport and museum? No. You're not. Well, there is a museum, but you can never go back into it. This game doesn't really have interiors to explore and revisit. But similarly, you won't find a golf course and, um, the desert in Stillwater. So it stands on its own. Seriously, it's not bad, it's the only reason to give this game a second look as a sandbox game. Driving is in the style of AOM in that it constantly demands that you pull a wide drift around every corner you encounter, and I mean everyone. If you try to do a normal turn, you're always going to crash. I wish handling wasn't so drift-centric because this system offers very little in dynamics, but no real complaints here. I found the system fun in AOM, and I found it fun here. I wish combat was as simple as this. Though, even this suffers from their insane RNG defense system. Look at this. I should have ran this guy over, but the game magically decided to make him invulnerable as he springs out of the way to safety. Awesome system, guys. Love that throwback to Driver 2. Another feature I was surprised to find myself enjoying was the wingsuit. Didn't see that one coming. It's actually a feature that makes a lot of sense. Santo Aleso is a large area to traverse, and the wingsuit makes it fun to cover large distances. We are sacrificing vehicle surf and parachuting, but this is the kind of Saints Row 2.5 I can get behind. It's over the top for sure, but in a way that fits within the bounds of classic Saints Row. And as a bonus, it's pretty fun. Huzzah! But okay, that's really it. It's the only major praise I have for this game. I can scrape the bottom of this septic tank and try to piece together something that might resemble a decent game if you squint really hard, but it's not going to kill the stench. This game is shit. Let's talk about the story, the main campaign, the big draw. I want to try and go through this as quickly as I can, but make no mistake, I'm going to try and provide enough context to show this game makes no fucking sense. After an awful TikTok video transition to a foreshadowing of your character's demise, we flash back to when we were an unnamed private military rookie working for martial defense, and it's your first day on the job. You're eager to work, though a little naive. It's clear you're expendable to your employers, and yet you still give it your best. Oh, the things we do for rent. You're going to be hearing that a lot. Anyway, you're brought to this abandoned mining town to take down the Nawali because they're 
bat or something. Hey, where are you fucking going? I said you're coming with me! Anyway, after confronting Nawali, he runs away and hijacks a VTOL. The completely absurd way you get on the VTOL aside, this fight sequence is actually badass. I was fearing that it was going to throw us into a series of QTEs, but no, it plays out like a good action scene with some intermittent turret shooting. Overall, this is better than the opening of Saints Row 3. I caught him! Back at Marshall, there's this horrible moment where you admire these three Glee Club members in the door of your locker. Oh wait, these aren't the gay kids that dance and sing, they're your roommates. As expected, your hard work is downplayed by your superior and you're basically told to remember your place and fall in line. I need to go on a quick tangent, because it was here in the parking lot that I discovered another thing that feels off about this game. Just the act of jumping on cars feels awkward. When you jump, there's this swoosh, and you spring into the air. But trying to gain any footing on the car is a challenge, it kind of pushes you right off. It's little things like this that add up and make the experience of this game feel overall janky. Something just doesn't feel right with the engine. It has that AOM feel, when it should have that Saints Row feel. Another unfortunate design choice is we can't hijack any of the cars here. Come on, you're placing us in front of a silly vehicle. I love silly vehicles. But anyway, back to the campaign. We have to get in our busted ass pickup truck and drive to our apartment. As you drive, your character has a little moment with themselves. God damn it, fucking shitballs. Side order, a mother loving shit smothered, piss covered ass. The funniest joke in the game is uh, when the boss decries something as being just a pair of sweaty horse swinging in the breeze like a you're then greeted with some voicemail by your three friends who we are about to formally meet okay this is really the end right here this is some fucked up lynchian shit the moment this cutscene was approved saints road died there's a lot of cutscenes in this game i just want to play for you in full and let them speak for themselves because i'm not even sure i can find the words to express how fucking goddamn awful they are what sort of waffle maker can I get for 35 bucks? Uh, presumably one that makes fucking waffles? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this whole scene is pain, and it's supposed to be the introduction to our main cast of characters. I don't even need to mention how this isn't hood or gangster. We are so beyond that. Being an issue with Saints Row and Volition using the name is the only means of having anyone look twice at their shitty games. Indeed, this game is just bad by its own merit. Whatever the fuck this game is trying to accomplish with this shit, it fails. I don't have to love it, I have to pay my student loans. Pfff, <laughs> I'm in. Dude, what the fuck? Literally what they're going for here is a scene from a 90s era sitcom. I think they're attempting to make that joke. I'm not really sure. There's no laugh track, it's not completely hammed up in a sitcom style. So if that even is the joke, it's executed poorly and completely cracks the foundation for everything the story tries to build on from here. These characters don't really peak after this. Even in their loyalty missions, the game gives us little to no reason why we should give a fuck about these characters. It's just straight up, these people are your friends. Accept that. After seeing these cutscenes in their proper context, it finally makes sense to me why marketing was so bad. Also, the facial animations remind me of Mass Effect Andromeda at times. Anyway, we then go rob a payday loan place, and at this point... It's just whatever, if you could somehow get over the initial shock of the previous cutscene, you can tell me how you feel about this scene. There's nothing but a giant void when I look at it. But then, it somehow gets worse. There's this really cool standoff with the cops that for a brief moment actually pulled me back in. What's gonna happen next? I'm on the edge of my seat with excitement. Oh, did you think you were about to see a compelling action scene? Nope, just some Bollywood bullshit. Womp womp. You know what, this entire thing is like something you'd see in Saints Row 3. But the difference is that whole game was made up of these kind of scenes because that was kind of its thing. This cutscene hits a level of batshit stupid that we never see again. There's crazy moments that happen in this game, sure, but there never is over the top and convenient like this one so it just becomes this weird, lazy one-off that feels like it robbed us of a much more interesting scene. This next part, we're given another assignment by our superior Gwen to follow a convoy being overtaken by Los Panteros. Mom. We're then just introduced to this JR character as our driver when the mission starts, and I feel like this was a poor introduction to the character. I mean, JR, much like Gwen in a way, ends up being a completely useless side character 
but it just feels awkward to start a mission hearing this gruffy voice with no formal introduction. Hey there, my name's JR. We about to see some action? Nope. We don't get that until much later, and I don't think he even appears in a cutscene. So as a side character, he's completely unremarkable and not much better than an NPC. In fact, all the side characters are like that. Even Zemos and Angel are more memorable than this. I might be nitpicking, but I feel like in addition to telling a bad story, the game isn't directed well either. After an intense chase with Sergio, the payload falls into a giant hole with a setup that I thought could be an introduction to the melee system, like a one-on-one -on -one fight. But it was to introduce the concept that some enemies have an extra layer of health that must be destroyed before you actually do damage to them. Using melee sucks against enemies with this shield. Actually, it just sucks in general. So this entire moment here really fell flat for me, and once again reminded me that they ruined combat. But at least it leads into a decent action scene. Anyway, thwarting the Pantera's convoy has upset Nina, which we find out via text bubbles. This is the only real conflict you'll ever see from your friends. But our CEO Atticus Marshall is impressed with our work and invites us to work security at the unveiling of the Hummingbird Codex. What is the Hummingbird Codex? I have no fucking clue. Everyone wants it, but what the fuck is it? It doesn't matter. Literally, it doesn't matter. You might as well say it's a funky pop. I have no way of explaining why, but it's some kind of artifact that every gang is going after. They all end up raiding the museum, the codex is stolen by the idols, Marshall gets pissed you didn't protect it, and fires you. We get to see Atticus throw a tantrum over the codex, but you would think he'd have some plot against the idols to get it back. Something interwoven into the bigger story? Nope, it literally amounts to nothing. But there is this random Marshall board member named Myra Star that you save. Be sure to remember her. The writing is all over the place, but to the game's credit here, this cutscene at least gives us a glimpse into the psyche of a cold and callous businessman so encompassed by greed that he values results over human life. It's the only character development you'll see in this entire game. But anyway, it all leads into this QTE-filled depression sequence where you order a bunch of JUDAS KNIVES! And here's another issue this game has going throughout it. Nina and Kevin are members of the Panteros and Idols, respectively. Because of this dynamic, there's a few plot devices where you have the characters conveniently tell you what their gang is planning on doing, and it pulls conflict out of thin air. Like, Kevin is the DJ at an Idols party. Eli is with him because of course he is. Oh no, Nina just got a text that the Panteros were planning to attack the Idols. We gotta run. It's just a series of loose expositions, and you never once actually see what these gangs' true motives are outside the second-hand information you get from your friends. All those dramatic moments in Saints Row 2? Shit, even all those dramatic moments in Saints Row 3 at least let you observe these inner conflicts and you got to see the motives that were driving these gangs and their increasing desperation to stop you as a threat. But whatever, this story is fucking trash. Let's keep going. Can I have a white wine spritzer? Eli gets shot in a crossfire, this rando member of the Idol Collective demands Kevin kill everyone, and now you might think this guy's an important character, because, well, he talks and has a fancy helmet. But he doesn't even have a name. It's just more random conflict because they need to establish that Kevin is more loyal to his friends. You defeat the idols, rush Eli home because he can't afford the medical bills, and as they patch Eli up, the boss becomes inspired to start a gang. What? Your car was right, Eli. About everything. Yeah, what the fuck is happening? Guys, we're really good at what we do. So why are we doing it for other people and not ourselves? Wait, are you really good at what you do? You just got fired. I'm in. Fuck. Yeah, let's do it. Nina's down. Kev's down. Snickerdoodle is definitely down. Eli, this cat suffers no fools. <laughs> and neither should you. Yeah, it's a yes. It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. You bastards. And just like that, this is how the unnamed friendship gang is formed. Holy fuck, even Saints Row 3 had better pacing than this. We needed moments that showed your friends interacting with their respective gangs. The only context we're given is through what they tell us in the missions, and it's really not much. Sergio is angry, watch your back. The idols want to destroy the concept of money. There's no depth to any of this shit. The game really needed moments that showed us who our enemies are, something that makes them feel human, or fuck, any of our roommates for that matter. The closest we ever get to that is when Nina's mother's car gets destroyed by Sergio. It's actually a really powerful scene, but the surrounding context to it all is something she tells us after the fact. And so just like that dumbass billboard scene, it all comes out of left field and leaves you wondering why any of this shit even matters. 
Sergio doesn't even talk. Apparently, the Pantero's code is that destroying someone's car is worse than killing them, and this becomes the main plot for Nina's revenge. In the next mission, Nina gets her revenge by destroying Sergio's truck. And... Well, that's it. Conflict resolved. I guess that's supposed to make him mad? We never see Sergio's reaction to any of this, and so we're just left to assume Nina got her epic revenge. It's fucking weak. For Kevin's big moment, he gets kidnapped by the idols and tied up on top of the Santo Eleso sign in a plot to blow it up because... Anarchy or something. Thanks to your training at Marshall, you're able to defuse the bombs and save him. At this point, after you untie Kevin, it's almost like he doesn't even exist for the second half of the mission. You wingsuit down into the idol's anarchy party and take down who I assume is an important idol member. And that's it. Conflict resolved. There's no real build-up to the fight, no post-fight cutscene to make it feel like you've accomplished anything from doing this. Again, it's just an overall weak moment that serves no real purpose to the story other than to remind you that Kevin was a member of the Idols. It was also in this mission that I discovered that you're pretty much invincible when flying a helicopter. I was trying to crush the main Idol here, but the game wasn't letting me. All the while, they're shooting into the copter at point-blank range and doing nothing to the copter's health. Another huge blind spot in this game's attempt at an open-world combat system. Anyway, back to the story. I mean, I'm just kind of jumping around right now because the next few missions after this are just so fucking stupid. Nice. You did say we need to have our fingers and more pies. I've got that covered. I spent the whole day baking my ass off. Okay, fine. They're empanadas. That's not a pie. It's in the pie family. Now I'm really hungry. They get the church as their safe house, have an epiphany to call themselves the saints, there's this dumb shit that has the boss compete in a live stream battle royale, and in one mission, populate your crib with purple shirts. And that's it. That is the extent of you starting a gang. I'm fucking serious. The next few missions after that are about how the saints need to raise money to pay these guys. Pay them for what? What the fuck are they doing? It's just vague criminal empire shit. It's so diluted and dumb. This game just lacks substance with everything it throws at you. And we're already halfway through the game around this point. It gets worse. With the looming problem of not having the money to fund our gang, Nina conveniently recalls there's a martial payload that the Panteros were planning to heist, or something. And that they should do it too, or something. The saints then decide that the enemy of our enemy is our friend. Wait, no, that's not it. The boss just thinks if we randomly break Nawali out of prison, he'll join the crew's extra muscle for a train heist. Like, something something, we have to break the Nawali out of prison. At least all that bullshit they condensed into a single cutscene leads into a prison break. It's a great mission, has a great homage to Saints Row 1, and that's really kind of it. You break him out and part ways for a bit. To really show you that the balls of Saints Row was removed, they have you unironically wait in line at a donut stand. If you break line, you have to restart. If you die after this boring shit, it takes you right back to waiting in line. Wow. The mission after that is called Corporate Retreat, where Nawali basically calls out how stupid the theme of this entire game is. The mission is to further drive home the point that we're all just a group of friends doing friendly things so that we can bond together. As friends. All the while, Nuwali is completely baffled why any of this shit even matters for a gang. It's almost like the writers are completely self-aware in this moment. They know none of this shit makes any sense. They know that they just wrote some bullshit and called it a day. And if you relate to the Nuwali here, you must not have any friends. Hashtag unrelatable. I don't know, because at the end of all this, despite being initially put off by their behavior, he kind of becomes one of the boys. I don't know, we'll come back to this. I guess the whole point of this was to establish that the Nawali is now fully on board with the Saints and their plan to rob the Marshall train. Before the heist, you give Nawali a JUDAS KNIFE! <laughs> which he later uses to kill Sergio and saves her life. So much for Nina exacting her revenge in a proper story arc. And who the fuck even was Sergio? Who cares? Money fight! If it sounds like I'm doing the story injustice or leaving out any important context, I'm really not. It's actually that shallow. It's like the entire game is back-to-back -back Morningstar arcs from Saints Row 3. Little to no build-up, and so when a major event happens like the fall of a main enemy gang, you're left feeling underwhelmed. I have no issue with Nawali being the one who takes down a major enemy boss and saves the day. I actually think that's a really great way to build up his character for what's to come. But this is the last time you will see Nawali until the end of the game. The next mission reintroduces the Mockingbird Codex. Kevin decides that if we take it, it will establish the Saints as a real institution or something. You take down the Idols, and then you have the Codex. Th that's it. The Idols are no more. Who were the Idols? I'm still not sure. Was there even a difference between them? We are the Idols! Fear us! 
Was any of that shit supposed to make sense? What is the codex again? Does it really matter that much? I guess it does because look, your gang is cheering you on. For the first time in the story, you are formally addressing your gang. Whee! It's on to the marshals now because thanks to a non-compete clause you signed when you joined them, the saints are now in their complete possession or something. But with the help of board member Myra Starr, you know that woman you saved, you overthrow Atticus from his own company and thus get the rights to the saints back. Yay! And guess what? We're at the end of the game! Hey look, it's Nawali. Where have you been, buddy? We just took down two major factions within the span of three missions. Oh well, who cares? Friendship! Then, in a shocking twist that nobody could have possibly seen coming, he stabs you with the Jodas knife. In any other context, this scene would have been great. The betrayal, burying the boss alive. It's a powerful scene, but much like Nina's car, it feels completely forced and misses the mark. Still, this scene is the absolute best scene in the game because I wish I could stab the boss too. But the moment is short-lived. The game puts you in control of this weird-ass sequence where you walk through the previous events of the game as if the boss's life was flashing before their eyes, but in the least cinematic way possible. The entire thing is basically a rewrite of the last mission from Agents of Mayhem. It's fucking really bad. Remember that one cutscene with the children's board game? They turn that into its own long-ass sequence, and it's literally like a tutorial mission for a game designed for mentally disabled children. I miss the in-game missions in which we assassinated politicians. I miss the in-game events like fighting a private military in an underground mall. This weird age play shit Volition is on. This fucking humiliation fetish shit. Just whatever, the kid's game eventually turns into a nightmare as your friends try to make you feel guilty for... Well, I don't know. Seriously, listen to this. Okay. I'm here. If you'd been there at the idols party, I wouldn't have gotten shot. Eli. Eli getting shot? What? I've got your back. You? You couldn't even kill Sergio. The Nawali had to do it for you. Bitch, shouldn't you have been the one to kill Sergio? I wasn't calling you. Don't you get it? You're just not a good enough friend. No. And because Kevin literally has nothing going for him as a character in this game, all he can say is, You're a bad friend. The game had no depth to any of its scenes, so this trope is not working. This pseudo-conflict of making the boss out to be a fair-weathered friend, like, what? Okay, whatever, it's bad. I guess because we haven't had any real build-up for Nawali being the main villain, they had to write the boss hallucinating a monologue for him. Then this little shit steps in. It gets weird. It's about to get weirder. We crawl out of the death hole, I guess. Wait a minute. How the fuck did we crawl through that mound of dirt? Well, don't think about it too hard, because here's the biggest mindfuck twist of the story. Nuwali apparently has no friends, and so out of jealousy, he stabs you and captures your friends to force them to act out a slice-of-life stage play in which they are his friends. Okay, I have no fucking idea what's going on here. Why are they on stage? Why does Nuwali give a shit about these stupid-ass, fucking garbage excuse for characters why is Nawali's gang complicit in this madness? Who the fuck even are they? Just to recap Nawali's character. You fight him, you free him, he saves you, he stabs you. That's it. That is the extent of what we know about this character. The, that, that's the big final act of Saints Row. He talks to the rest of the crew for maybe like a second and now he's obsessed with them? I guess since they're reframing this entire scene in the context of being in a studio... That disgusting excuse for a cast introduction scene must have been some weird sitcom reference. But why? What sense does any of this bullshit make? What is the deeper meaning to this? Is it really all hinging on that one dumbass mission about friendship? Am I fucking insane or am I missing something? It's making me question my own sanity like the entire game is an elaborate troll. Like Volition purposefully wrote the worst story they possibly could as one final fuck you to the fans before they killed the series off for good. I don't want to think like that, but I really need some explanation. I want director's commentary for this shit. What were they thinking? I demand answers. Who possibly approved this? What was the data-driven research that gave any of this the green light? Were they really trying to write a cancelled after season 1 Netflix series? I am at a loss for words. Who was the target audience for this? Who? I guess they expected that those stupid fucking retarded kids who love Saints Row 3 grew up and are now wage slaves with college debt and deadbeat friends. This was in no way made for Saints Row fans, and you fucking know it. Hate to tell you this, but Saints Row fans expect a little more than customization and ragdoll physics for this to have the honors of being a reboot for the series. There was no way this was made with the spirit of Saints Row in mind. 
Saints Row 2 point 5 my ass. Here's an idea. Get the Saints Row 2 patch finished. I know you guys didn't want to crunch too hard and trust me it shows, but now the reboot is out and I expect to see the patch released before the end of the year. At least. We've been waiting. I know I shouldn't be too hard on the smallest AAA studio and all, but when you're building off old tech and releasing buggy software that is universally panned by fans and critics alike, it's time to drop rank. Volition, you would make a great indie game studio that makes sensory stimulating games for children. Hell, you just made me play one. And holy shit, I can't believe I made it this far and I haven't even mentioned that the game is really fucking buggy. This game was set to be released in February. I can't even imagine the state that it was in. In one instance, my weapon model bugged out and it forced me to fight everyone using melee. In another instance, my entire inventory disappeared and once again, I was forced to use melee. Really sucks I couldn't just pick up a downed enemy weapon here. In some missions, you'll have enemies spawn outside the boundaries. No way of killing them and you'll get a mission failing return to the battle prompt if you attempt to get close to them. Right here, I had to wait 5 minutes for my gang to kill the enemies out of range. Only for one random ass enemy to spawn on the freeway again. And if you think I can just restart the checkpoint and reshuffle the wave, I really can't, because there's no checkpoint here, and I have to start all the way back at the church. Oh yeah, I don't know if you caught it, but Nawali isn't bald. In one scene, because it's pre-rendered, you can see the light change from the brighter setting I put it on, and you see his hair. Then BAM! Back to no hair, and my brightness settings are working. It should be mandatory that if you have to download large patch files to fix a game you just bought, you're entitled to one free major DLC pack of your choice. Otherwise, why would anyone pay $60 for a game that needs post-release polish over the course of weeks, maybe months? They tried that with AOM before giving up, and the game is forever a heap of janky mess. Let's just hope they can fix things fairly easy in time for their alleged multiplayer add-on. I have zero faith that system is going to work. There's not a chance in hell. Oh wait, we're not even done with the story yet. Nawali has this moment where he snaps and smacks the fuck out of that Steve Urkel-looking ass bitch Eli. And as he's on the ground looking stupefied, Nawali gets flustered. It's weird. I feel like there needs to be 40 more missions in this game to even come close to explaining how any of this bullshit makes sense. Oh no, Flippy. Don't you see? Nawali just wanted a friend. Well then why the fuck didn't he just be friends with the boss? The only character that even remotely cares to interact with him. Oh fuck it, who cares? Here's the boss saving the crew. They don't need my help. I need theirs. Okay, this motherfucker right here, if we're talking about how shallow, underdeveloped, and flat the three roommates are, this fucking cat is only in the game for like three cutscenes. You wouldn't think twice about him except, God damn, it looks like a Brazilian 3D bootleg of Garfield. One ugly ass looking model. The whole character should have been cut, but somehow they deem this little bastard worthy enough to act as the voice of guidance for the boss as they lay dying. And now this little fuck saves the day. There's not enough establishing moments for this shot to resonate. But even with context, it would be the most limp, cheese dick. Oh, who fucking cares anymore? You end up on the roof, you have a standoff with Nuwali, you win the end. To anyone who says story doesn't matter in a game, fuck you. I would never put myself through this poorly written bullshit schlock again, even if the actual gameplay of the missions were fun. Because truth be told, there are some decent missions. About 7 of the 25 are pretty good. The combat system of course ruins the overall experience, but the missions themselves aren't that bad. But they will never be seen to the potential they could have had, because the bugs make it bad, the combat system makes it bad, the story definitely makes it bad. So I have no other conclusion than to say this is a bad game. The culture of the Saints Row team is long dead, lightning in a bottle, and this game proves that more than Saints Row 4 ever did. Without your endless supply of pop culture references to act as a smokescreen for how sloppy your narratives are, it is so easy to see that no one at that studio knows how to make a Saints Row game anymore. You wrote yourselves into a corner, had no choice but to reboot and undo the clusterfuck nosedive the series took, but then you jumped right out of the frying pan and into the fryer. Did you learn nothing from AOM and how utterly unremarkable it was? Who the fuck is in charge of combat design, that's what I want to know. That motherfucker definitely never played a Saints Row game and I fear that he may be disrupting the feature as some kind of excuse for why he should be promoted or paid more for the innovation he's bringing to the system or something. Fuck off! You're not innovating shit! You're just ruining what should be a basic thing. I don't know what the future holds for Saints Row after this. I really don't. They might make enough money for a sequel, but who the fuck wants to see a sequel of this? Whatever brand recognition and pull Saints Row had is now tarnished. But if they do release a sequel, when's that gonna be? 2025? 
Will Deep Silver continue to cut their budget because they don't want to risk the liability of a mid-grade studio punching above their weight? And in 2025, we might have GTA 6 and other much more interesting AAA titles out there to compete with. Where's the path for Saints Row from here? For the sake of the studio, the entire creative team needs to be vetted. You might have some saboteurs within your tribe. There's poison in the well. There should be a leveled clearance system that prohibits certain people from getting anywhere near the writer's room. You guys really need to launch an internal investigation for this immediately. If you need new writers, I'm sure there's some kind of after-school writing program at the Champagne Delinquent Center. You can find some recruits there. Your target audience will resonate with it. You know, whatever is after Gen Z. I feel like you guys are so close to finding your niche with that. I got it. Volition, you need to bring back Descent. Saints Row had a good run, but please don't touch it again. You need to capitalize on the VR market. Imagine it. Free space VR. I know the perfect man for the job if you need help. But whether you guys decide to do Descent VR, Summoner 3 Pocket Adventures, or God forbid Saints Row 2, I hope that by then you'll listen to all your ex-employees on Glassdoor who are vocal enough to say that there's too many cooks in the creative kitchen. It's very clear something is wrong internally with management, and if something isn't done about it, your humble little country town-based AA studio will degrade into a stepping stone for game dev flunkies. If it already hasn't. Oh how, for- <laughs> oh, how could I forget? Love Shack! If there is a Saints Row 2, it needs to start with all these characters dying in a head-on car collision. That's the only way I see Volition redeeming this story. Anyway, that's it. I don't know what else to say. I'm just so goddamn disappointed it took 8 years, 8 fucking years, to finally play a new Saints Row, and it manages to be worse than Saints Row 4. I've seen some pathetic-ass apologists for this game. Flippy, please give them a break, they're a really small studio. I don't give a fuck if they're a small studio, they're still charging full price for this mediocre game. And the funny thing about all of this is that it looks like the reboot is actually selling really well. So to put this all into perspective for you, they got an Epic Game Store exclusive deal which saved them a lot of money, licensed a bunch of cheap ass music which saved them money, as far as I can tell they completely reused a good chunk of the Agents of Mayhem system for pedestrians and vehicles and such. And so this game probably had a shoestring budget, especially when you consider the layoffs and the small team and all that. But now the game is a chart-topping success, and you could say it's because it was a well-timed release and there's scarce competition for open-world games right now, but that still means a mediocre game has sold well. And so their data-driven research, aka what made them the most money, is going to result in more of this soulless garbage for their next game. What happened to Go Woke, Go Broke? Seriously guys, let's reflect on that. If I haven't made myself clear, I fucking hate this game so much it's unreal. I think it has psychologically scarred me in ways I'll never fully understand. But that's not going to change the reality that the game was a success. And of course everyone is talking shit on it now, justifiably in my opinion. But they were talking shit about it before its release as well, since the CG trailer. I thought their whole marketing campaign was terrible. Even putting aside the whole reactionary aspect that came with the fact it was a reboot with some gay-ass looking characters, and I mean that in the least offensive way possible, I didn't want to judge a book by its cover, so I didn't jump on the hate train. But personally, even looking past whatever big bad woke agenda people were claiming this game had, I just thought all the marketing looked too overproduced and yet had nothing to say. Like everything was either a slow motion panning shot, fast motion cosmetic swaps, hard cut action shots, and it seemed like they were just trying to jiggle their keys at us and avoid even talking about the campaign, which we all now know why, but apparently, that's all it took. That was enough for them to surpass their pre-order sales goal. That was enough for it to sell millions of copies. That's what they mean when they say we're the vocal minority. The game has already outsold Saints Row 2, and that's sad. That's just so fucking sad. It justifies the buggy release. It justifies being an epic exclusive. It justifies all the corners they've cut. It justifies not releasing a narrative trailer because story doesn't matter. 
and they now know they can actually just sell people bullshit and they'll buy. I don't know why. I know we've all been passionately crying out for a return to the series' roots, but take this information and realize it's all futile. And I'm not saying that to try and tell you to stop speaking your mind about this shit. On the contrary, please, it's been extremely comforting to see this new generation of players call this shit out. But realistically, there's nothing we can really do now except continue to wait for the Saints Row 2 patch, whenever that's going to be released. Given their ambitious plans for this piece of shit's post-release upsell, I wouldn't hold your breath. But it never hurts to remind them. Huzzah!